outputs. Stefan Hecker's MD CME Activity Director has no financial relationships related to the content of this activity to disclose. The presenter has no uh, financial relationships related to the content of this activity to disclose. And Psychiatry Grand Rounds receives no commercial support. This talk may mention off-label or investigational use of drugs. And the code for credit is listed on the opening and closing slide. And it's also embedded into the bottom left corner of most slides throughout the duration of the meeting. The code must be texted to 855-776-6263 within 24 hours. As a courtesy to our speaker, your microphone is muted and your video is not enabled. Questions will be taken at the end and you can utilize the chat or Q&A uh, to ask questions for the speaker to address. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Markovitz. Thank you. Thank you. I hope folks can hear me OK. Well, I'm so delighted to get to introduce Dr. Esti Sharon. I'm going to read her bio and then just make one or two comments. Uh, Dr. Sharon is a licensed clinical psychologist at Mass General Hospital and assistant clinical professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Sharon serves as the director of Recovery and Relationship Enhancement Program at West End Clinic at MGH and is one of the founding members of the Diversity Center at the Department of Psychiatry at MGH. Dr. Schroen is also the founder and director of the innovative virtual program called Recovery Works at MGH, therecoveryworks.org. Dr. Schroen's expertise is in substance use and dual diagnosis disorders, working with patients, spouses, and affected families. In addition, she provides ongoing supervision to psychiatry residents and fellows at MGH, I think. At Harvard Medical School, Dr. Sharon teaches first and second year medical students, the developing physician class. Dr. Sharon earned a master's in clinical psychology degree at Tel Aviv University in Israel, a doctor of psychology degree at William James College in Boston, and a master of science degree in clinical psychopharmacology at William James College in Boston. So on a personal level, Dr. Sharon was one of my mentors um, at uh, the Mass General um for uh one or two years when i was in fellowship and we struck off a tremendous uh mentorship and now friendship and so i'm so delighted that she's here with us in nashville and i hope we will all uh learn a great deal from her talk so thank you so much thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr markovich and uh, good afternoon to all of you uh i'm here at this country for almost it will be 33 years in july uh, and I gave up of the possibility of changing my accent. <laughs> Please know that uh, you'll get used to it. It may be sounding quite off in the beginning, but I'm sure that with no times, you would be able to get used to it. Thank you so much for the Vanderbilt chair, Dr. Hecker, for Dr. Markovich and other people I met today, some people I know from the Mass General. Thank you for inviting me. It is really an honor for me to be here. And I want to know, you to know that although I'm going to present, there's a topic and you'll see what I'll present. I want you to know I'm here because I believe we must start collaborating across states, across systems. And I would love for us to start the conversation about that because there are many programs that we started spearheading in, in the field of addiction that I believe needs to be joining forces to make it possible in the way that we want to impact our society and we want to reduce the level of the, the pandemic, the epidemic of the opiates in particular, but substance use in general. Uh, I also want to say, Dr. Markovich, when you were a fellow, it's a nice correct connection you inserted here. The audience may not know that you would correct, correct the, the history here in the background to say that I'm supervising not only residents, but also fellows at the Mass General, and that uh, Dr. Markovich as a fellow in the addiction services came one day and said, I'm very, very interested to learn about working with families and relational therapies. And I thought, wow, not only is the Mass General a general hospital, giving the stage for psychiatric practices, but also within psychiatry, with the MDs psychiatric training, there is an interest in what seems to be a pure psychosocial approaches. And I thought this is too precious of opportunity to not take advantage for resulting in five years later me standing here. Thank you, Dr. Markovich. Okay, so um, I am a little bit excited, nervous, but it would pass away because I'm not, I don't have public speaking issues. So uh, here's we are at the, uh, the topic. I want you to not get confused as I prepared, I was invited to present at the conference you guys had in October, 
and COVID was a barrier. And it's, I'm amazed since October how much I changed my talk. So this talk is going to be a little bit everywhere because I tend to be a little bit everywhere and I hope I'll collect it to something more concrete at the end of it. So be patient with me with the process because I'm going to walk through many systems. I mean, this is a relational therapy talk and it would be kind of touching a lot of systems. You'll see some of this I'll go very fast and some of this I'll go is in a smaller pace, in a, in a different pace. So these are the objectives and I'll try to um, adhere to them and many of them received it when you had maybe the talk and you would probably do the evaluation accordingly. And I hope you'll come educated in all these dimensions. And this is the overview. Again, I'm going to skip on this one. But basically, as I said, I'll go from the very generic to more specific and coming back to the generic. Uh, OK. So uh, so the, there is, a, in, although this is, was published in 2008, but uh, this uh, uh, the Federal Reserve's annual report on the economy and uh, well-being of U.S. households suggested that in one in five Americans know someone personally who has suffered from opiate addiction. And at least 25% of the population belong to families affected by this addiction. We actually now first agree, or I also know an added data point is in any employer, in any workforce, 25% percent of the employees are affected by addiction. About 9% directly affected, having the addiction themselves, and about 16% have family members fighting. Uh, these are very striking numbers. And then the data also suggested here that up to 90% of the individuals with active addiction live at home with the family of significant other. What if not that data point to suggest we must intervene on that level? So, uh, I just put it out as an anecdote, although it's outdated in some ways. Um, okay, and then in, in preparing here, I thought I'll, I'll go and look, what are the definitions of recovery nowadays? And I thought I took two sets of definition, one coming from SAMHSA and the, that one, although it's in 2012, suggests it's a process of change, uh, individual, where individuals kind of improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed, life and strive to reach their full potential with four dimensions that we want to support them in, which is the health one, the physical, the emotional, their home, to have a stable place to go back to, purpose, which is a big one. We talked about it with some of you earlier today. And, uh, you know, with the purpose and hope to become active participants in society and the community, the community, the relational, relationship and social networks, which would be a core aspect of what we'll do today just as well. So I read a very beautiful article on my way here on the flight because I just stumbled on it. It came from Yale and other organization that looked, I'll tell you later the name of it, and did some kind of analysis on these uh, definitions. And it never occurred to me until I read it that this definition doesn't talk about substance use or mental health. So as much as it is beautiful because we want to be inclusive, it is also dismissive and kind of really not serving the population we want to highlight having the most need for. And I was actually shocked by this comment because it shows my blind spot where we are so embedded in what we do, we don't see sometimes the simplest things when we take it, just a, a, a look, kind of a perspective, a look out of this perspective. So. Um, now, there's, there's guidelines and principles and, you know, the hope it needs to be person-driven, self-determinant, many pathways from the very kind of a traditional pathway to more alternative ones, which we all want to embrace nowadays, with holistic, obviously, carrying all of life dimensions between the mind and the body and the, and the spiritual and the community, to the relational, cultural, trauma-informed, which we know by uh, today that we have to pay attention to. And uh, it really relies on, on uh, highlighting, celebrating the strength of individuals. And I'll get to it in a minute later on with much respect. All that I said now is written in this slide. I'm not going to go over that. 
But I do want to talk a little bit about recovery-oriented systems of care, which is another very important concept that came about apparently in 2012. To that, I'll say, the article I just read on the way here was about recovery-oriented systems of care, a perspective on the past, present, and future. The reason I'm, I'm so grateful, this was published online 2021-2022, and the reason I want to highlight it, it's because I personally uh, was shocked that I was not fully aware of these concepts and what do they mean? And when I started diving into them, I thought, wow, this article tells us why is it that it's still engaging us in trying to translate this operationally? What are these systems of care and how do we arrange them? How do we integrate them? So, that's why I'm putting it here, because remember, I'm talking about relational therapies and systems. So um, there's a family is a system, and the circle of friends around the individual struggling is a system, and the providers around the people with addiction is a system, as much as the politicians around us who are the policymakers, and as much as those kind of integrated systems of care. So it is along that definition that integrates all of our dimensions, life dimensions. It's not only about the medical or about the addiction that we are here trying to recover or help people to uncover. So um, the one thing that I want to emphasize, this is a coordination. It's an attempt to create in the communities a lot of treatments that would address different needs of us as individuals and to make sure that these are really well integrated. And it really lies on the premise of the continuity of care. And that's why I highlight that we want to go from the prevention, early intervention, treatment, and then continuing care and recovery. And it's critical because the more we engaged in implementing some of these ideas, the more we would move away from the acute care, which we are now in, in this country with substances, and would really go to early intervention and prevention. So we are going backward from the acute to the preventive. Uh, so again, it's incorporating the traditional treatment as well as the alternative. Some of you told me today, we know the a, a career coaching, the peer recovery, recovery coaching is of essence nowadays, acupuncture, meditation, yoga, uh, a music and art therapy, and so on. Uh, okay, so this is a beautiful, again, diagram suggesting all that I talk, again, by SAMHSA, and, a, and some of the core values we are talking here are very, um, are, are in some ways, you know, a, a, a captured by this with the involvement of family and friends, care, providers and allies in the community. I want to put this one as a title, really, about all the integrated systems of care. So, uh, okay. I did go ahead and look for other definitions. And I came across the definition of recovery that was offered by the Alberta Health Center in Canada. And the reason I'm bringing it in, because I don't want redundancy, or repetition, the reason I'm bringing it in because now we pay attention to how they really spell out, they really fully spell out recovery is a journey. So we are improving mental, physical health. We are bettering relationship. We are creating the employment initiative, which is our other, uh, a, my other kind of program that I spearheaded recently. The community participation, the inclusion and greater cultural and spiritual balance, but the key thing again for me here in this definition is oh, oh moving too fast. Uh, oh. Yes. Sometimes it's, it helps to just yes. take a mix or maybe even it's okay. I mean it's like <laughs> uh let's see if we can get out of presenter mode for a second. Stop sharing. So, in terms of what I wanted to say there, the part of this definition over there is saying not only do we need to cover all of these dimensions for the individuals, but also for the families just as well. So, uh, 
that's okay, because I can meanwhile take a copy of my presentation and continue while we're figuring the technical. I never thought we should be <laughs> 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 Yes, yes, yes. So, all school languages. So, um, let me just see where I am. Is this the slide you want? No, the one before. There we go. Or even few before that. Okay, then. Before, before, before. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. No, this one, sorry. Um, good. <laughs> Thank you for the alertness in the audience. Uh, Let me so, uh, end it. So, do I do, how do I move now? Same way. Same way. Okay. Okay. I apologize. So, that's, I'm not going to do it again, but that's what we talked about the, uh, not only for individual, but also the family and the community. This is at the heart of this talk that we forgot to know and to uh, employ those services and those recovery expectations from our dear ones, as well, from our dear ones as well as from the family members of our dear ones. Okay, so uh, and we need to be comprehensive and instituting it at all systems, as you see it here. Uh, and again, the reason I like this, and not for redundancy, but the add-on. Really, the emphasis here, the way that the Canadian gives you the best behind the podium I learned from some texting. Oh, Excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you. I love on I love ongoing feedback. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Markovich. Okay. So I love the walking, but I I, I can I can also anchor <laughs> myself here. So okay. The emphasis here is placed on bringing family allies. Uh, and uh, work, and workplaces into systems of care in order to build a recovery community around individuals in need of support. And it must be founded on kindness, on compassion, and caring with the goal to empower people to use their strengths and skills to, you know, to live the life that they are aspiring to with much dignity and respect. Uh, and so on. Okay. Recovery capital, again, a very dear concept. I'm sorry, just very dear concept to us, for us. I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, we actually talked with Bill White uh, several years ago when we were instituting the other program. And I'm amazed at the humility of these researchers that really, really, in the 1960s or 1970s came up with this idea. You could see how slow we are moving to catch our attention in the 2000s. So recovery capital is the breadth and depth of all the internal and external resources that a, a person can be drawn upon uh, to initiate and sustain recovery. But those resources can be as much as need to be accumulated and we can help individuals accumulate it through the relational therapies, medical therapies and other treatment, as much as we could help them accumulate it, they are so easily depleted just as well. And definitely through the years of using or through the uh, fighting or dealing with the societal stigma without getting support. So the recovery capital also, you'll see, I'll, I'll walk through you through the types but they are very easily quantified. So they could be a great measurement uh, a, for a outcomes. And uh, we know we are moving into the empirical kind of base practices. So they can be used and are used in that way. And they are tied to the concepts of resiliency and protective factors, wellness, and the uh, general global health. There are three types of them. They are the personal, they are the family so social, and they are community. With the personal, we are talking about the biological makeup, the genetic predisposition, the uh, values, the education, the financial capital, the employment, the income, uh, and, uh, and also the virtues of uh, hope and purpose and the way to uh, rely on those and seek help. So this is on the personal, on the family societal, it's about the relationship that we create that would be supportive of our a, a, a journey and a, on all levels and the organizations or institutions like the workplace, the school and the culture all is the whole community 
what, what kind of role models do we have in this community? How much do they teach us and willing to talk with us about the recovery? How, what are the efforts that the communities are doing to defeat conscious, unconscious bias, discrimination and stigma? Uh, all of which would help us kind of flourishing. So we need to find ourselves around these cultures that would enhance this sense of uh, a, enhance our motivation to pursue this, uh, a, a, the recovery, which is the hardest to initiate the recovery process. Drug courts, a, employers, friendly employers, and whatnot. So, um, okay. All of this is to summarize. Okay, so a key component of recovery is the ability to reclaim lives and move forward with dignity, purpose, hope, and direction. And to my view, and I'm still breathing and celebrating the encounter of this transformational conceptual paradigm is the following. We are moving away from looking at the culture of addiction and we are looking at the culture of recovery. Those are two profoundly different uh, cultures. We are also, by virtue of, we are looking away from the pathology and also looking at the resiliency or the health or the growth in health. We are looking away from what is essential, very supportive aspects, the self-help groups, which are typically the 12 steps and other self-help groups, which are without which one would not be able to recover. So I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm going to say here. But those settings are really looking into the past. We are revisiting again and again our wrong doings, our flaws, the way we have betrayed our people, we are soaked, absorbed in these practices. And, and a, whereas, you know, the spiraling downward, recovering or in our memory, those stories, which is essential for us to remember. Remember, we say, remember, a, for, so I'm sorry, forgive, but don't forget. So the remembering is essential, but it's overly engaged in that it may drag people's spirit downward. We want to move to the culture where we are highlighting for people the values. They are connecting with their core self. They are remembering themselves of their accomplishments, of their virtues, uh, of their skills, many of which they lost sight of and they need to be remembered. Help, uh, they need to be uh, um, gaining our help to uh, remember those lost faculties, if you will. Uh, and also the departure from the social dislocation, uh, exclusion, discrimination, bias, stigma, to create a social inclusion, embracing our own people back, and uh, social integration. Uh, in this article that I recently heard, they talk about the citizenship, and they want to remind us, I didn't put it in here, that the uh, that the the Responsibility of a citizen is a right upon any one of us. But somehow the field of addiction brought us to think that that right is actually a reward of your recovery. No, it's not. It's a right for whoever you are and whatever you do. It cannot be placed as a reward. If you do this, we could give you back these rights. No, that it's we need to change our thinking in that way all of which is informing my relational world. I hope you understand. So I'm not departing away from the topic. It's like no human is an island. So we are all the time among our people and we are supposed uh, exposed to these biases or uh, if you will, uh, conditional contingencies or conditional uh, inter love into all conditional interactions that actually damage us. So being in recovery, having the right of part active participants in society is a right of any individual. It's not a reward for people in recovery to aspire to. Very important for me to uh, emphasize this. Last thing, I had uh, a, a, I had a, a beautiful a kind of a opportunity to engage in very meaningful conversations with who, are, who used to be the ex-editor of the controversial British new, uh, paper, Sun, The Sun. So David Yellen is also one of the trustees in one of the greatest movement, movement, uh, movement in addiction in the UK, um, action on addiction. He 
I'm quoting him because I just love this quote. He himself is in recovery. He disclosed his story in 2010. It was uh, published uh, all over the Guardian. He also published a book later. And he told me that mom is a journalist well known over the world. And when he published that book or when he disclosed his, his, his recovery, he was immediately cut off of all ties. All of his allies and friends in the Wall Street Journal, in the, in, the, in the business world, in the journalist world, cut all ties for him. And he said he took the courage to come out and speak about his recovery and to publish about it because it is a way to defeat stigma. And he said it is time to celebrate successful recovery as a luxury good or an asset. It's an inspirational path associated with attainment, success, and sometimes happiness too. Uh, and in all dimensions of life, the physical, mental, social, familial, and also vocational and career related. So, uh, okay. Lastly, Johan Howey, I'm sure many of you know him, is a British journalist. I want to make a point here when Johan Howey texts to us and suggests that addiction is not a substance disorder, but it is a social disorder. That does not mean that he is negating the very foundation of addiction being a medical disease. It's very important for me to emphasize that. So his, his talk is amazing in the 2015 talk. And I learned, I was, my, my aspiration is to go to the government of Portugal and to ask them, how do they do it? We'll still do it, maybe together, because it's like, it's amazing what happened in this country in terms of uh, really truly a, a offering the true optimal conditions for people who's funding with dual diagnosis, substance use to flourish. So addiction may disappear even with the minimal social stimulation and connection, which is the, as they call him, the Red Park researcher, uh, Bruce Alexander from his work in 70s and 80s. And if you don't know it, look at it because it's low. Again, 40, 50 years later, where we are heading, going back to, uh, and, and the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. So connection can be interpreted in many ways. Integration is one of them. So, okay. Um, oh, sorry. The other way to say what we just heard from your Harry is that addiction is the disease of disconnection. So the opposite of addiction is connection and addiction is disconnection. And family, friends, allies, they often assist in identifying substance use problems among their dear ones and encouraging them to seek addiction treatment and recovery. However, and that's a big however, and that's why we are here today and I'm doing the work I'm doing. Family and friends and allies are also at risk of contributing to the very problem of even or even inadvertently perpetuating it. If they are not an integral part of the recovery treatment with their loved ones, and I'm emphasizing the with because we know there are a lot of venues that were presented to support families who are struggling with someone with addiction. But those support systems, al -Anon, you know, uh, cope, uh, learn to cope and what are, and others were parallel to the path and the addiction journey of the dear ones of the individuals. And we are talking about integrating. It needs to be with. It's a very challenging uh, practice. OK. So at the Mass General, uh, we had opened up, we called it the Recovery and Relationship Enhancement Program uh, several years ago. Uh, and, and we called it like that because we didn't want to, when you use family or friends, we all have immediately kind of connotation, what does it mean? And we wanted to use the most broader definition. So we use another, the, the colloquial, the casual name that we have is the SSO program. So SSO stands for Supportive Significant Other. Again, there was a catch here in English. I live between two languages, but in English, that's Significant Other. You immediately think about partner or parent, but it could be a roommate and it could be your sponsor at AA. So anyone who is supporting, who is significant to the person is supporting them. So it's a broad and inclusive set of family, friends and allies. So we, at the point of the person having an intake and coming into our outpatient care, 
addiction curve. At that point, we tell them about our program and we actually highly recommend for them to come in and participate in the treatment with their dear ones. In what level? It's for you to decide. It could be one or two very scattered ones, just for educational or for the provider to know your family member. It could be intermittently when you feel you're kind of hitting a, a road bump and you want to kind of facilitate this hurdle. Or it could be when you want many of them move from these intermittent casual meetings into actual ongoing therapy, family therapy, couple therapy, etc. So we did a retrospective study because we wanted to see how does these services impact our people and and the and in this we did we took the patients who had SSO. Remember SSO is like the family slash friends slash relational therapy uh, along with the along with the uh, patients who didn't have and we did take the with the SSO group we took it, these people who had at least two sessions. It, they could be five years in the program outpatient, but at least two, two sessions during these times. And we extracted the data from the electronic medical records, and uh, we were kind of uh, uh, defining what length of stay is, and what did we find, okay? So 72% of the families in treatment, those who were invited once or twice randomly by their dear ones, return after one educational SSO meeting. Okay, there is a wish to be present with the dear one there. Uh, in 47% of these families, the patients, I know some of you call them clients, pardon me for the terminology, but the patients range from the age of 20 to 39. So you could see even more the kind of the fear and the yearning of families to help their uh, young ones. Um, so uh, here's the thing. Patients who started the SSO therapy within the 30 days of the first clinic contact and attended at least two sessions uh, were more likely to retain, remain in treatment than the cohort of match ones who never engaged. Uh, 52 weeks later, you'll see it in a minute in the graph, uh, after entering the clinic, 76% of those of patients remained in treatment, 76% of those receiving SSO treatment remained in treatment compared to around 50% who never received the SSO. You could see a huge impact on treatment retention. How do we keep them in? Here it is, the same, the same idea here. Uh, I don't know how to, uh, the same idea here in terms of at uh, this point here or the 52, you could see the gap between the, the dropout so to speak, a gradual phasing away from treatment, it's much faster among those who did not have the SSO treatment. And it's more steadily above for those who did have the SSO treatment. So this is a striking uh, data to suggest we need these services. Okay, so um, what to summarize, what do we want to do in this relationship enhancement therapies or why do we do it? It's kind of the rationale behind. So first of all, individuals struggling with substances should never, never, never uh, stay and be the sole carriers of the problem. It's not anymore you, you need to change and we will sit and observe and support. It's actually uh, you need to change and I need to change just as well. It's a foreign concept, guys. It's a real foreign concept for people. Why do I need to change? They need to do the work. Uh, an individual in recovery entails everyone else in recovery. Uh, the community of family, friends, uh, a, a, the healthcare providers, uh, even sometimes the roommates or the sponsors, they need to be coming with them to us. And the concurrent and early involvement of these substance use patients with their families is really essential to lower the risk that I call there is associated with changed individuals returning to unchanged environments. It's really, that's what it is. And you'll see in a minute, I'm going to a little bit of elaborate on that. So the rationale systems like any system, the biological, the ecological, the mechanical, the human are striving to seek a balance point. And sometimes they are compromising with an unhealthy or dysfunctional balance point for the sake of having the balance point. 
Uh, and in that regard, when a system is balanced, maybe around a person who is fighting addiction, then when that person leaves and goes to rehab and now in intensive treatment, he throws the system off balance because it's shaking ground here. So if that system is waiting in this shaky ground for that person to come back, that person, by definition, who has done some work on change, is coming back to occupy the same niche he had before or she had before, which is the troublemaker, the person who is using. In my view, this is one of the reason, primary reasons for the repeated relapses, among others. But uh, we, 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 uh, we dismiss, we don't typically think about it in that way. But if that person went and this family does a little bit of kind of transition, each one of the family members is doing a shift of the niche, then when that person comes back, they have a profoundly new place to occupy. And that may absolutely increase their success 10 times. It's, it's my theory, uh, but it's, a, I think, a very compelling theory. So because the system is restoring, is looking to restore ability, stability, as I said before. So when we pursue new and healthier balance points, we are then uh, leading to better functioning systems. And we do this calibration, I called about of the interpersonal uh, a, a space between. It's essential. Now, people don't like this approach. And not only people. Individuals in recovery don't like it. Families dread it. Uh, insurance companies forget about it. They don't want to pay for that. I mean, we are all opposing it and there's no enough forces to join to, to advocate for it. It's essential in my view. And then well, what are the hurdles? Of course, you know, there's fear of resist, uh, resistance of change for change and the fear of change, which we all share as human being. Uh, and there is the stigma and the shame. Those families need to come out. There's still a lot of shame, not only by the people who are struggling with it, but their families. How did we as parents or as siblings or as a, a, a communities allowed for that to, I mean, the, 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 to happen? And that sense of, of stigma is really keeping you away from seeking help. So the fear of being judged, of being blamed, of being shamed, uh, and uh, and when they start coming to us, we suggest to them, no, there's no blame, there's no fault approach here. Because I have the system perspective, and for those of us who have the system perspective, we know that we are all kind of, uh, we are all subjected to forces that are above us and within us. And it's very difficult to defeat those forces. So that's what we are doing here. We are defeating the societal forces now, not only the family forces. So I'm thinking if you look at it like that, then for everything that's happening in the space between two people or more is the contribution, active contribution of the two people or more, maybe not 50, 50 percent. And so it's like it's not about blaming who did something wrong. It's about understanding that we are perpetuating relational patterns that are detrimental to the well-being, not only of those individuals, but of us as families. So we also believe that shared vulnerability enhances connectedness. I'm sure you're buying into this concept. I'm sure you know Renee Brown's beautiful tech to talk about that. But and typically in those families, the engagement is so much on the practicality. You need to, you need to quit, you need to be good, and highlighting the badness that parents or spouses forget to share the I statement, I call it. Talking I statement. Don't tell me what I did to you. Tell me what you feel. Tell me what are your fears. Parents, family members, partners forgot to share about that. And the more we avoid sharing it, the more them, the people with addiction, feel blamed and accused as if the happiness, my happiness, only relies on them. But that's not the case. So the shared vulnerability. And then the social interactions and playfulness. They are essential to, I think, in life in general. I hope you have time to play and go to the sandbox, so to speak. And the Red Park, as Bruce Alexander says, but without that, I mean, how can we energize ourselves to move forward? So, uh, of course, these people, are. Uh, but their and their dear ones far forgot about this. So, uh, okay. 
what our role in these relational encounters to identify uh, a dysfunctional or unhealthy, I don't like the word dysfunctional, unhealthy, to identify unhealthy relational patterns and to actively disrupt them. Of course, throwing the family of balance, remember, in a different way, but they are all there with me to be able to restore it and to suggest restoring it with a more healthy balance point. So, and then empower true love. I'll get to this because this is a little bit more on the clinical side and I want to explain. So I, I, I pulled out some relational patterns that I identified in the work with people with addiction and I want to highlight them. The first one is the externalization of internal conflict. Big words for a phenomenon that you know very well of. We have also different terminology for it in psychology. So what do we mean? So if I'm in recovery and I, the, I'm here in already in treatment, which means you remember the, the stages of change. You are, I'm, I'm far beyond the pre-contemplative and contemplative stage. I'm definitely in the action stage. I'm here seeking treatment. And then for me, I'm engaged still, some of us, some of us are full abstinence, some of us are still partially losing, using, but losing and using, but still want to engage in treatment. At that moment, I am in internal conflict. And the simplest way to put it, to use or not to use, to drink or not to drink. Uh, and I need to be on this pendulum, which could be very draining for a long time before I transcend above it and achieve the higher level of progress and growth and health, which is recovery, whatever my recovery goals may be. So it's very difficult for me to contain this kind of pendulum and this vacillation, and I'm looking to break, a very healthy break for it, and I have that break by my SSO beside me. Whoever it is, my sister, my parents, my husband, my wife, whoever it is, my child, because they watch me and they care for me, and they say, you have to stop it, you know, it's risky. You, you are really going on a path that may not take you to a place of any good. And if they do it intermittently, but leave me with the conflict, that's beautiful. But what happens with these people, the more they are exposed to my reckless behaviors and the more they fear for my health, if not for my life, they step in more aggressively to remind me I need to stop. And the moment they do it more consistently, it's the moment at which inadvertently they send me deeper into my addiction. Because remember of these two arms of the conflict, they take over one arm. They take over the arm of you should not use or drink. I'm left with one arm, use or drink. So there's no more internal conflict, but then it's very easy. They become, that conflict that was internal is externalized to fights with them. Don't tell me what to do. I know better, I didn't drink as much as you say, I wasn't blacked out yesterday, call my boss today and I promise you I'm not coming to work, you don't do it again. I'm fighting them. It's much easier to fight something external to us than to fight something within us. And unbeknown to all of us, we are kind of sealing, sealing off one of the most disturbing relational patterns that can be and truly emerging from a true genuine care and love. And I'll tell you, I sit with families and I sit and they come to me maybe at the most heightened conflicts between them. And when I talk to them about that, they look at me and all parties in the room, in the room those who take on the side of the conflict and those who relinquish that side of the conflict, all sides of the room are immediately kind of have an eye opening this is resonating is such a true, and it's generic. You see, it's generic, but it is so specific just as well. Then the other one is the invisibility, invincibility dimension. You'll see, I love playing with words. I live between two languages uh, and I love playing. It's all of them. I keep, I keep reinventing the, the language, uh, the English language as much as my language, which is Hebrew uh, ongoing. So I like the invisibility, invincibility kind of a uh, sound of it. But what happens with families with substance use for the good reason of wanting to save the face of their dear one and not to disrespect them and not belittle them, they are making them invisible. 
but the more invisible they are making them. They are, uh, uh, again, feeling down, they are amplifying their sense of invincible, because again and again and again, there are no consequences. I hate to say consequences because I'm not going into the punitive side, but again and again, it's like I, I would think, I mean, that's the first time I'm asking my mother to call my boss that I'm not coming to work. She saw me kind of blacked out all day yesterday. She said nothing. So I feel so invisible. And the more she does it, my other parts of the brain that are not kind of bypassing the, the kind of the, the frontal lobe are kind of getting permission to continue to do it. Nothing happens to me. I can be beyond it. And that's so risky. And again, I offer this to families and they will say, oh, my God, that which we think we are protecting ended up profoundly damaging. So um, that leads me to the importance of limit setting and setting boundaries in the family institution. These are parts of the work, the clinical work I'm actually doing. And to uncover that unsaid and unspoken. I mean, I believe I, I didn't even introduce myself from the school of thought for me for, in psychology was originally very psychoanalytic as I'm coming from a country that is still celebrating it from Israel. And I'm very committed to the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic uh, approaches. But at the same time, I'm also really working very closely with the uh, solution oriented, cognitive behavioral oriented, obviously family therapy, system therapy. So uh, I believe that we all have unsaids existing among us. And I believe that the more we, uh, the more we retain them and anchor them as unsaids, the more of a power they take over us. If you think only about this, take it to whatever systems you want, take it to the workplace, take it to the family, take it to the extended family encounters. Now, I don't mean to say that we need to uncover all the unsaids, we are really, people with a lot of privacy on all these circles, even in the very intimate circle, we are, have the privacy to keep certain things remain unsaid. On the other hand, we need to measure what is, what is the unsaid. As I said before, the mother and son, it's an unsaid. It's a huge unsaid of the mother that she is uh, hurt by seeing her son or daughter going down the spiraling downward and don't have the words to say that it's a huge unsaid that may lead that parent to eventually ask their child to leave home and never come back. So I'm saying uncover the sads when we could still rescue the relationship and restore it and don't come to me at a point where the unsaid when it's sad it's ending relationship. A lot of them I see in my I, I, my heart hurts when I see it because I am relationship and family is the essence of my value and the community where I come from. So using true love as opposed to tough love as a leverage for change to promote accountability, reclaim responsibility and sense of agency and to find the inner voice and the motivation and determination for recovery for all involved. I'm going back to the Canadian definition of of a recovery versus the American for all involved. So, uh, and I have some beautiful examples to show you that that, that which we had formulated as, uh, as the uh, tough love. I have many people say, I'm not going to kick out the, uh, my child from my home. And I said, I never asked you to kick out. I asked you to say this. This is a big difference, but people lost sight of this difference anymore because they kept accumulated it internally to reach a thirst or thirst threshold of no return. And they are not open to the fact that setting limits is not kicking them out, but telling them, I, as your mother, who still works very hard, cannot sleep at night because I'm standing by your bed so that I wouldn't watch an aspiration or a dead child in the morning. I, I cannot take it. I'm flooded with anxiety. It's affecting my cognitive function. Remember the vulnerability, shared vulnerability, the I statement. I don't ask you to stop drinking, but I'm telling you one thing. There's no more drinking in this home. When you want to drink, you go to your friends. If I say it from a place of true love, I'm telling you, you are going to change based on what I said. One example, a woman, uh, she was about 18 when it happened to her. She was raised by a very unfavorable 
uh, almost like project-like environment, but in a family, a single mother, in a family whose mother instilled in her the basic values for education and decent life. And she had internalized all of these values, but then she was exposed to what she was exposed and started experimenting and more seriously. And, uh, and mom could not take it anymore, could not take it. It's like she saw her daughter going down uh, and didn't know how to stop this deterioration. And that daughter at the age of 17, 18 came home and tried to come home, couldn't open the door and started to open another door from the back, couldn't open the door, stood behind the door and said to herself, if my mother, who I don't even have the slightest doubt how much she loves me, close the doors on me, I must be in a very, very serious shape. She took herself to body lab, rehab. She's one of the most highly functioning individual that I've known with a beautiful story, and it was for her one time. But it was the love, and I did it to some of my patients. I had beautiful stories to tell how they came back to make amends as a therapist. Who makes amends to you? Uh, and thank you for doing this. Yes, I know who makes amends. It's really and and uh, uh, but uh, and and promoted themselves and their life to an amazing places. Okay, I know we need to end before I want questions. Uh, this is the resources for family and friends. I do want to tell you, in light of all of this, I instituted a program, Recovery Works. As I told you, the state already invested one million in us. And I'm now speaking, I know now 20 of the 40 senators of the Massachusetts. Uh, personally, I've never done this kind of work. And I'm also doing a lot of 160 representatives in Massachusetts. <laughs> so there's a long road to go. And uh, because I, I decided I want to intervene on those levels. This initiative is amazing. If there is an initiative, although it's creating the work opportunities and wrapping up individuals with amazing services for them to uh, flourish and go back to society. Remember the dimensions of the, you know, employment is one of them, purpose and meaning and hope. But uh, uh, but this initiative is really a, a direct derivative. I'm sorry, I forget to stand here. Direct derivative, direct derivative of the relational therapy. So it looks as if it's not related, it's integrated to that. I don't have time to talk about it now, but I invite you to go and please look at the, it's a huge and amazing program. I'm sure that we would collaborate because we. this is going to be a national program. Uh, when we get this money from the state, we use the money from the state locally, but we get donors' money, we could go beyond borders and uh, we could collaborate and you could send your patients to us now to receive our services, just for you to know the level of collaboration, let alone more close collaboration. And please visit this website to learn more and you see some of our clips and whatnot. Okay, now this is the references, and this is what I want to say in this queue. Please remember the portability, scalability, compatibility, and collaboration. That's what I want to leave the event of it tonight with. No, I'm not leaving tonight, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I want to leave Vanderbilt with this kind of mission. So let's find a way to collaborate. Thank you very much. Yes. We have a few minutes for questions if anybody wants to uh, jump in or virtually. Yes. I have a question. When you're working with the two individuals or more in the uh, uh, kind of the family setting or the system setting, what are you specifically looking for as far as the the substance use behavior. Do you look for the function of that behavior in the in the system, or how, how do you approach that? It's a beautiful question, and it touches upon the second objective on this talk. Is you know, addiction may be a cloud that is kind of above in the space of these two, three, and more people, and 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 is it is our goal to remove this cloud away? Uh, which means, but what does that mean? Removing the cloud away means, what does it mean? It means abstinence, it means resolving all the problems. What I've noticed is that often this cloud is really a disguise, a smokescreen for so many answers, as I said before, for so many 
issues that are percolating underneath that no one does to open. So the question is very valid. What are we looking? Yes, what's the function of addiction? What, what, how does it serve the people? And, and how ready is the system to face that which relies underneath? And oftentimes, as a system now, not individual, as a system, they are not ready. And it's my role to show that there is maybe an adherence to the addiction. I work with people where, a, 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 where abstinence had been established, let's say, five years. We're still talking about addiction. And, and, and it's a long journey for some environments more to honor others to uncover it because addiction does serve a function on many systems and let alone on family systems. So, yeah, thank you for the question. Lisa. So I enjoyed hearing about some of your what you the balance piece that's sort of your thing. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak more to that, like how you conceptualize what is in balance. Um, it sounds like almost with that question, but sort of answering out of balance and what you're doing to help get someone in balance. But what's the prototype for like a family system and the individual who are in balance? Yes. And sometimes, I mean, as you could see, I mean, I'm very direct person, uh, no to be present and even more so no to be provocative. So please don't be alarmed. I mean, I'm doing it with silk gloves just as well, but uh, uh, I may sometimes say it explicitly to people. I may, first of all, all that I shared, I believe in full transparency. I believe that the best audience here today would be professionals and the residents and trainees, as well as the patients and the families and the policymakers and the board of recovery works is made out of all of these people. We have 20 people on the board outside of the Mass General, which is, they told me once, Mass General, there's no other program that are board members outside of the system. Uh, but uh, but here, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saying, uh, 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 sometimes I would, tell them, I would share with them some of my thoughts, and sometimes I would introduce another story that I think may help them to unpack or to at least relinquish this fear or tight holding to their problems to not uncover something. So I'll give some examples. Uh, sometimes, by the way, I give a lot of examples from my own family. Nobody knows except my family who is not listening to that at that time. <laughs> I'm joking. But I do take a lot of a, 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 a lot in, a, a examples to a, scratch that kind of place with much gentleness. And sometimes, depending where the family is, I would be explicitly telling them that. That I've, I'm working with you. And I know, and if you're willing, I can share even with you what I think you are kind of hiding or covering or what your fears are. And again, talking about love as a cover as a, as a coverage, a love is a leverage for change. I mean, if I do it from that place of true love and true care, because I do get attached to my patients, uh, my families, when I come from that place, they can take anything from me. They really can. And it does take a lot of a seasoned abilities, connection with yourself, with your transference, if you're familiar with this counter transference, to know that they won't feel that you are just employing that kind of judgment or stigma or bias. And if I am, I tell them, open my eyes, I want to learn. So I engage in very genuine conversation in that way. I take the car the, the opportunity and the courage sometimes. No. Thank you, Dr. Schroen. I, we're, we're out of time, but I think you piqued everyone's interest, and I'm sure a lot of people have more questions. Some of the trainees will be at a lunch afterwards, and feel free to get in touch with Dr. Sharon through me. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I already feel so connected. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank